Hi everyone, welcome to this week's Sky Sports Golf podcast or a vodcast. We're in the studio this week at Sky and what a week as well, Masters Week. Probably some people's favourite golfing week of the year. Plenty to talk about on this week's podcast. If you're listening, you can go over to YouTube. It's on our YouTube channel there. Absolutely free. It'll be on Sky Sports Golf as well. I've brought in two big guns for this week's podcast to talk all Masters. Tim Barter, David Howe. Very good afternoon. Are you excited, Tim? Very excited. I mean, we haven't had a major for nine months and we, we want majors yeah. all the time because we see the best players in the world all come together, which we'll undoubtedly talk a bit more about later on. But yeah, 261 days since a golf shot was hit in a major. You like a stat. I do like a stat. So how excited are we about the Masters? Extremely excited. It always brings a brilliant environment to play in, doesn't it? We know the golf course so well. It creates drama. It creates excitement. So yes, I'm... Very excited indeed. I, I love that you know it was 261 days. I just <laughs> thought, I just thought for a bit of fun, I would chuck that in. Between you and me, I mean, it was ages, ages <laughs> yeah. since that last a while. Last, when was that? A while. It last, was last a little tongue-in-cheek. Last just year, come wasn't on. it? <laughs> now, I know there, there are some golfers, David, still playing like you, who don't really watch golf at, uh, on TV at home. Are you an avid watcher of golf? Are you there with the Masters watching every single minute this year? Uh, had it on last night. Yeah, funnily enough, yeah, live on the range, brilliant. Uh, no, Masters is amazing. It's the the tournament really that I well as you know as a kid mm. you were waiting for the music to come on when you were the spring the dreary at home in the UK wasn't it and you were waiting it felt like the start of golfing season back here when the Masters came on um, all those years ago and uh, um, when I was a kid um, it definitely helped you know boost my conf. I'm not talking about boost my confidence. What was it? My interest. <laughs> yeah. My interest yeah. in the game um, inspired me. It was brilliant. And of course, back then, it was always Europeans at the top of the leaderboard when we um, when we turned on. So yeah, love the Masters. Watch as much as I can uh, in amongst parenting three children, which is pretty hard work as well. In the Easter and holidays time the consuming. <laughs> Tried to get them into it. It's not happening yet. Really? No. Have they been watching you? Is that uh, why? Uh, no, they don't watch me. <laughs> 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 but if I can tell them that you're on, yeah, maybe there's a chance. Definitely not. Um, you've actually had a couple of great results, Augusta. Best result, can you remember? First year there, I think, was I 10th or 11th? 11th. 11th. Well done, well remembered. Yeah. We'll come on to it a bit later on, but as a, as a debut goes, not bad. Yeah, I was, yeah, I've had good moments each year that I've played. I only played there three times, mm. um, but something good happened in all of those years. Um, uh, it's a course that suited me. used to love it, and uh, was like, it was like a, being a kid on Christmas Day when you arrived. All the pros there this week will still be like, that's what's beautiful about it. I remember being in the locker room, um, and, you know, Jack Nicholas was excited to be there. You know, Monty, just mm. incredibly excited. Like, they're not like that normally. Monty was, you know, grumpy or whatever. Or, just So it's just an amazing environment. Everyone there, if you like golf, it's the place to be. It is the place to be. Before we go on to the Men's Masters, first major of the year, we have to mention, Tim, an English winner at Augusta just a few days ago. Lottie Wode, who won the Augusta National Women's Amateur in sensational fashion, I'm going to call it. A back nine for the ages, Tim. She was absolutely incredible down yeah. the stretch. I mean, she started the final day with a two-shot lead. Another girl went out and shot 66, bogey-free. Mm. <laughs> Shoemaker. Not bad at Augusta, Fantastic. by the way. Yeah. So she posted a number very early on, meaning yeah. that Lottie knew exactly what she had to get to. She bogeyed 13, the par five, three putted there, and it looked like, oh, this, mm. is, this is really struggling now. Made a brilliant up and down at 14 from a very awkward spot holding a 15-footer. Now she needs three birdies in the last four holes, and she produced them. 15, 17, 18, incredible. Hit great shots, great shots off the tee. Mm. Stuck the irons in closest to the hole. Hold three brilliant 15-footers to actually get it done. A girl from Farnham, which yeah. is my area. I grew up in that sort of area. Um, so Farnham Golf Club, very familiar to me, and she was a member there, and, and now she's over in America um, at one of the universities. But fantastic golf under the circumstances. She looked as cool as a cucumber through the whole thing. Even the fist pump at the end was kind of, <laughs> yeah, get in there. And you think, you've just won the most magnificent tournament on Augusta National, finishing with three birdies yeah. in the last four holes. It was incredible. Yeah. Amazing. She uh, joins Arnold Palmer in 1960 and Omira in 98 as champions at Augusta who birded their final two holes to win by a shot. Not bad company. Brilliant. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's a great new event, isn't it? Yeah. So, it's just brilliant. I think it's really getting the imagination of the, of the golfing world. It'd be interesting to see how it, how it continues on over, over the years. But uh, does it does it rival, you know, the, the, the US ladies or I don't know, where does it sit in the pecking the order point. of championships? I don't quite mm. know. Um, uh, but I, I tell you what, 
I mean, you're going to remember that for the rest of your life, no matter what, aren't you? And uh, as you said, the manner in which she managed to win, to hold that putt on the last, um, to birdie 18, uh, as you say, and 17, absolutely incredible. So she's obviously got a big future, you'd have to think. Mm. It gets her to four of the five majors this mm -hmm. year. She's, depending what she's going to do at Florida State, where she is at the moment, uh, we, we're going to see. Surely there's a strong argument soon for one of these women's majors to be held at Augusta. Yeah, you'd have to hope so. Maybe this is the precursor to it. Yeah. You know, it's something that we've seen over the, what, the last five years, the, the amateur tournament take place. So ultimately, you'd like to think the league professionals will get that opportunity as well. And uh, it would be a great thing to see, I say, because, you know, that course is something that we love to watch. We're also familiar with it, as we've already said. So why not let the ladies have a crack at it too and uh, and see how they get on? Yeah, that was go well, Go watch the replays of everything from Sunday. It was so I nearly swore there. It was so good from Lottie Well. Congratulations, Lottie. I enjoy the celebrations. David, I mentioned your debut in 05. For 99.99% of people watching or listening, they're never going to play at Augusta or play in the Masters. Can you give people just an idea of what that first drive down Magnolia Lane was like, the locker room, stepping out onto the first tee for the first time, things like that? Monday morning, I sat, I mean, so excited in 2004. Child at Christmas. Yeah, yeah, didn't play the week before so I could arrive on the Sunday. Okay. Um, pretty sure Monday morning is as early as you can arrive, I think. Pretty sure it was early Monday morning, so I'm, I don't know, eight o'clock, as early as I could get there. Uh, drive up down Washington Road, you know, heard about the drive in, <laughs> looking forward to Magnolia Lane, see the entrance, amazing. I mean, just on cloud nine, yeah. turn up. Security guard, they've, what, they've, they've got a name, haven't they? The security guards mm -hmm. coming with the, the, the um, Pinkertons or something okay. like something like that. something okay. like that. And they're there all the time. Probably the same guy's been there for forty mm -hmm. years. I think just going to open the gates down. Off I go down the Magnolia. Mr. Howell. Mr. Yeah, basically, welcome. <laughs> sees the car. If you just like to, yeah, take the first right into the gravel car park uh, and park wherever you want. And there's someone to meet you down the bottom. <laughs> Didn't get to drive down it. I don't think I've ever driven Hang down on. Magnolia Lane. I kid you not, I've played th five, 2005, six, and seven. All the three years that I played, it was a gravel car park to the right. Oh, no. Yeah, gutted. Absolutely. I've never heard this before. No, Have you I heard this story? No, yeah. Absolutely not. Well, so... Yeah, I don't think I've ever driven down. I walked, I walked over to have a look. Looks lovely. Yeah. Nice bit of tarmac. <laughs> Apparently, lovely canopy of trees. Looks tremendous. Never been down it. So you're I, the same as 99.9% .9 of people yes, watching, basically. Yes, exactly. I think they thought he was a caddy. I don't think they thought he was a player. Did you show a player's badge? Come on. Uh, yeah. So Amazing. anyway, into the clubhouse. Of course, you get the turning circle and you mm. see it. I mean, it's, we've seen so much of it now, haven't we? But back then, we saw less. But I remember being really intrigued. A, what's the locker room like? What mm. is it like in the clubhouse? A locker room small, you know, not enough lockers for everybody, wow. interestingly enough. So I turn up and said, oh, Mr. Howell, you're going to be sharing a locker with um, Harris English or whoever it was. So I was like, oh, I'm probably sharing because I'm a you know, rookie and you know, I'm just me. Uh, Monty's in next. I, I always keep mentioning Monty. Yeah, my go-to, take the Mickey person. Sorry, Colin. You know, I know, you know I love he you dearly. He loved this show. But, but Monty was actually in next. And, uh, and they say, oh, Mr. Montgomery, you'll be sharing with um, Chris DeMarco this year. And I'm expecting Monty to be a little bit, you know, put out by sharing a locker because, you know, we're not used to sharing lockers on toilets face back. And I would assume it was just me, the rookies, maybe, you know. Oh, thank you. Mm, thank you very much. So, that, that's, so uh, I was sort of take, a bit mm. taken aback, but it realised it was par for the course. You all share a locker because um, there just aren't enough to go around, which is, but no one complains, not even a of hint not. of complaining. Because as I said at the start, Every, it's Christmas Day for everybody. It's Everyone's so delighted to be there. It was amazing. And then I remember the first thing I wanted to do, having seen the locker room, quick walk back through the clubhouse, I just wanted to see how everything sat, sure. you know, course side. Where's the, where is the first tee? <laughs> Where's 10? And then I think it will have been the first time you went there as well, Tim, I'm sure. The drop away, down 18 and down 10, it takes your breath away. Really? You cannot believe mm. that the course... Is a, is down there? The, the the basically the most of the course is just sort of down this massive hill, and um, whilst we talk about it so much over the years, that was the impression I got. Blimey, there's only like four holes at sort of somewhere near the top, uh, ninth green, eighteenth green, the first, um, and the rest of it's, it almost feels like it's on another property yeah, down amazing. the bottom. It's really quite remarkable, and that they, they, that took my took my breath away. And then I remember that obviously the, the greens. You know, I was used to putting on mm. fast greens by that stage in my career. I'm at the Masters, but boy did I spend a lot of time on the greens because, I mean, you have to practice a, a one-inch one inch 
putting stroke, basically, oh. you know, one inch back, one inch through, but make sure you can get the ball set off on line um, because the greens are quick, but they're so slopey. You, know, you see it, you've only got to touch it and it goes 30 feet. Mm. So you need to be in, con- in control of that putter. Uh, Who did you play your first practice round with? Can you remember? Uh, well, very kindly, so Nick Faldo. Oh, excellent. Um, excellent. Nine holes. I think it was maybe, that might not have been Monday. It was a Monday or Tuesday okay. afternoon. We played the back nine together, which was very gracious of uh, Sir Nick to, to uh, chaperone me around the back nine and, uh, and show me uh, you know, where to go and where not to go, which was, which was amazing. That is very, very cool. Go on, Tim. First time I went to Augusta was as a spectator. It was my 40th birthday treat. Lovely. Just the other oh, day then. That was, yeah. yeah. 25 years ago. Um, <laughs> my wife said, you know, what would you like to do for your birthday? And I said, just hide. It's 40. I don't want to be 40. Anyway, she said, what, <laughs> what have you always wanted to do that you've never done? I'd, I'd love to go at the Masters. Well, you know enough people to get you a ticket. Go at the Masters. It wasn't like it is now. You can get a ticket easily. And I wangled the ticket, one from Lee Westwood and one from Darren Clark, which Excellent. was very kind. Got there, 8 o'clock in the morning, queuing up, not in the player's entrance, but in the public entrance get into the gate, want to run, but you're not allowed to run. And every time you even attempt to sort of gesture you're going to run, somebody appears to say, no running at the Masters, <laughs> no running at the Masters. Um, so I made my way over to the 18th green. I thought, first thing I'll do is go and look at the 18th green. And I got there and a member was stood there in the green jacket. And I'm just looking at the screen. And I said to the member, could I ask a question? He said, yes. And I said, why have they made the green half the size it usually is? And he said, they haven't. I said, but it looks on television twice this size. And he said, well, yeah, on television it does, but it's this size. And it is literally half the size really? that you think it is. And just incredible to me. I looked at it and thought, they've shrunk it so enormously. But it's a, quite a small green, really. I mean, side to side. It's mm. relatively deep. Yeah, long. But much smaller than it looks on TV. Mm. And I walked around, and I remember walking around the back nine, walking up 17, and looking to my left and seeing through some trees a tiny, tiny little green. I thought, oh, I'll just kind of have a look at that. So I wandered through. Tiny, and I'm thinking, oh, this is par three course. Cause <laughs> it's such a tiny little green. It was the seventh hole on the main course. <laughs> and that green is the size of a postage stamp. An incredibly slopey. And it was actually on the main course. And I thought, well, it must be a par three green because it's half the size of a small green that you'd see anywhere else. So that's something you don't necessarily come across on TV. It's amazing. It is amazing. I've, I've not had the privilege to go yet. Uh, hint to my boss there. But uh, it, it does sound absolutely fascinating. Let's talk about some of the nuances of the course of Augusta. And let's... The things you have to do well there. First up, Howler, driving distance is obviously a big thing in the game these days. Is it a must around there that you have to be long off the tee. You've got the likes of Scheffler, DJ, Bubba, Tiger, all long. That's offset with the likes of Larry Mize, Mike Weir, Zach Johnson, one of the shortest hitters on tour. Is it a must, driving distance at Augusta? Well, it's never a must. It's always advantageous, you said it. I think it's become more so. The course has got longer um, and and narrower over the years, actually, from the you know 20 years ago since I played. Um, but that the, they've they've got some land it's gone back again 13 famously this you know this year's gone back again so length is always an advantage um you know larry mize back in those days jose maria mm. um the disparity between the long hitters and the short hitters wasn't quite so big in, in, in those years so um i think driving the ball well listen of all the people at augusta they are all long enough brian harman is Brian Harmon long enough yeah. to win round Augusta? Well, yes, he is because he's capable of shooting 69 round Augusta. Is it more difficult for Brian? Well, if, yes, of course it is. Um, and it's, um, I don't think you, you can't go wide at Augusta anymore. Years ago, there was a lot more width. You have to drive the ball pretty darn straight. And it's incredibly difficult to hit the greens if you miss the fairway. I think I saw a stat earlier. Um, it's one of the hardest courses on tour to hit the green on if you miss the fairway. So you need to drive it at least adequately. And listen, let's face facts. If you're going to w- win a, a major championship in today's day and age, you're going to drive the ball well, aren't you? So I, I think, um, uh, you know, it's it's important, but it, it doesn't, it's not closed off to the short hitters for sure. Okay. Four par fives, Tim. How important to make the most of them all four days? I think it's hugely important. I think historic scoring tells us that you have to take advantage of those par fives because... The way the greens are and the way they tuck flags away at Augusta, as David says, you have to drive the ball in the fairway in order to access the little shelves and the little corners they're on. Some of the holes, it's so penal if you miss in the wrong place. If okay. you get short-sided at Augusta, you're going to make bogey because you, you sometimes can't get the ball within 20 or 30 feet and you'd have to hold a 20 or 30 footer to make your par. So, But players use slopes to bring the ball into the hole and so on and so forth. But there's quite a lot of holes there that you think par's a great score here just okay. because of where the pin's hidden away. So therefore, the par fives become the scoring zone, if you like, because all of them generally are reachable. Um, the pin positions are quite often in a position where you could make eagles, certainly at 15, and we've seen eagles at the second and 13 as well as well. So... 
yeah, you have to take advantage of par five scoring. They're, they are reachable for the decent length and longer hitters, you know, sometimes with a short iron. As we know, they've lengthened 13. It used to be, you know, for some people, Bubba, a drive and a wedge. Yeah. Right? If that isn't a great opportunity to make mm. birdie or eagle, I don't know what is. It's now more be more likely a drive and a medium iron. So it's it's got longer and more difficult. But yeah, take advantage of the par fives because you're not going to get that many chances to make birdie elsewhere. Mm, yeah, there's going to be a lot of players like Bubba that's going to have a wedge in the hand. Mike Weir came out. I, I'm not sure when he said this. But he said, after he won, he goes, I try to, in my head, think of all the wedge shots I'm going to have on the golf course. And there's about five of them. There's the par fives, there's number three. And really, that's about it. So if you play four rounds, that's 20 wedge opportunities for a short hitter. Uh, meaning that, that not many. Yeah, not many. But quite a good way to look at it, just to target those specific shots as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, Mike Weir didn't miss a putt for inside 10 feet. <laughs> that's also and, true, yeah. And, and that's what, you know, for someone like a Brian Harmon, you know, Brian Harmon, it is going to be incredibly difficult for him to win, to win, to clarify my point. Um, it's not impossible, but he needs to putt like Brian Harmon can and have his best ever putting week because it's going to be difficult going into greens with six and seven irons when others are going in with wedges. So um, there's no doubt if you can hit it 3, 10, 3, 20 straight on a regular basis, you know, that takes care of a lot of Augusta. Mm. Tim, what's more important at Augusta? Approach play or good putting? Approach play or good putting? Both are absolutely crucial. <laughs> okay. Um yeah, I mean, literally, you can't win unless both of those things are in really, really good order. I suppose you'd have to say putting because it's incredibly difficult to win a golf tournament now without putting well. And as David said, these greens are the slopiest, fastest greens that you'll encounter anywhere. These guys encounter greens that are really quick. They encounter greens that are really slopey. But the combination of the two, this is the greatest test their short game would ever face. They've told me. I'm sure David would, would say the same as a player who's, who's played there. So you have to have control of your ball around the greens. And obviously putting is a big part of that. Um, and you're going to get lengthy putts that you need to lay dead. You can't afford to three putt very often. They are on little shelves and little slopes that you, you know, you're going to have to negotiate. And they are incredibly quick. You're going to putt with you're back to the hole at times if you get out of position. <laughs> so you'd have to say, I think, putting. But approach play, I think when you look at the statistics down the years, approach play is the number one factor in yeah. the winner's um, strokes gain percentage, if you like. That's more powerful than driving it well. It's more powerful than short game, uh, around the greens anyway. Um, so approach play is crucial because in order to make the number of birdies you're going to make, because the average winner at Augusta, it seems to me, makes about eight or nine bogeys in a week, which is quite a lot for a win. Quite a lot. That's quite high. Yeah. But that's because every time you get out of position, you're in danger of making a bogey. And even the guys that are brilliant around the greens are going to make some. So they average a couple of bogeys around, even the winners. So therefore, you need to make 18 to 20 birdies probably in order to win at Augusta. Therefore, your iron play has to be dialed in because we've talked about the par fives. Yes, mm. they'll represent opportunities, but you're not going to birdie all of them. You've said this before, and I'll probably agree with you. In his pomp, this man was arguably the best putter on the planet, I would say. Feet. Oh, I use the word arguably. <laughs> I find that a little bit offensive, but I'll let it slide. Okay, that is nice of you. For you, what is the trickiest thing about those Augusta Greens? Um, well, when they get them, when, when they're in the hot, sunny yeah. afternoon and when they're firm, if it's not been raining, you know, those moments... Um, they're I mean, you put your putter down and the putter slides. You know, I remember that I, when I played with Tiger. You know, oh, that put the putter won't sit on the wouldn't sit on the green. It <laughs> slides. So you have to do a bigger gap. You, you know, um, so they're just inc they're just incredibly fast. And you get yourself in the wrong place. You know, you, you're either holding the four footer or you're three putting. You know, that's mm. what sometimes you just can't hit them soft enough to to dribble them in. You are going to be. Remember the famous one, Scott Hoke missed. To, oh. you know, eight, 19 inches to win he's got four and a half foot back which is an amazing putty holes and that's the thing you've got to be you've got to be so um, strong mentally and, and, and you've got to execute so well when you've got those above the hole tap, not tap-ins the three, four footers because if you miss them um, you're either hitting them with no conviction whatsoever or you've got to be prepared for the one back um, Fair to say that you would at times rather have a 10 footer uphill than a four footer downhill yeah, I mean, I think statistically you'd probably still do better from the four foot than ten foot. But, yeah, you get some very scary putts from above the hole. There's no doubt about that because you know you've got one coming back and no one likes a three putt from four foot. Well, that four foot, maybe it's the, the second putt and it's the four the four putt, isn't it? So mm. I remember when I got there exactly that, I, oh, I need to be so secure um, from three, four feet above the hole. The ones up the hill are easy because the greens are so pure. Uh, but the downhillers from short range, where you're not just trying to coax it to the hole. Um, and when you get nervous, 
Um, and the pressure's wet, then that, that could be round one if you're a rookie, or you know, it could be coming down the stretch, couldn't it? Or whenever your big moment in the week is Saturday, you know, and, and you're in the hunt, whatever it be, then you know about those ones. And sure enough, you could just, I did it, I played with Tiger, you know, round three. Um, Twice he's I, mentioned that, Mark. Yeah, there we go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I noticed that. Um, <laughs> and um, I couldn't, I was too nervous. I, I couldn't, really? so I couldn't hold the putts. And I frittered, I played quite nicely actually, mm. but I frittered three shots away by missing four footers, which I'd hold the days before because the, the mix of the speed, the situation, my nerves, th- there was too much. So I missed the four footers, three shots gone. You know, I finished 11th, but you know, had I been, you know, a, a, frankly, a little bit more in my own comfort zone, then maybe I would have finished higher. But that combination um, is tricky. Mm. Did you tell Tiger that you thought you were the best putter on the planet? I think he knew. Yeah. <laughs> Apart from when it mattered. <laughs> <laughs> that was obviously, 05 was obviously Tiger's chip in mm. as well on 6 to with Vern Lundqvist with the famous commentary as well, which we might play in the show uh, in a moment if I can find the clip. Um, you mentioned 89 and Scott Hoke. Should tell listeners and viewers, I chatted with Nick Faldo earlier this week. We're going to show some of that Faldo interview and we talk about 89 uh, as well. He relives 89. Uh, that's on later in the show. Hal also mentioned rookies. I'm going to come on to a few of the rookies later on. What is the toughest thing for rookies to work out their first time at Augusta? Well, the nuances of the course are such that the pin positions are absolutely crucial and understanding the consequences of every single pin position because obviously you're going to face 72 different pin positions as you go around in four days. And that's why the rookies don't play with their mates on on Tuesday, Wednesday, whenever it is the practice rounds are. They try and find one of the experienced guys. They go to Freddie Couples. They go to Bernard Langer. They go to Mark Amira when he was there. They would try and get to play with Tiger, arguably. Dallatoris did that earlier this week. Exactly. So that's the advice everyone gives them. Find an experienced player and have him educate you because they will be able to say to the guys, right, that pin when it's back left, you do not have any thing to do with that pin don't even try and go at it i know it's tempting with a nine iron in your hand but don't because if you miss it you will make bogey and therefore they'll be guiding them into which slopes they could potentially use to bring the ball toward the hole which there isn't maybe a slope available to them so just take your medicine put it 25 feet under the hole to the right two putt and get off because you will make bogey if you in any way try and take those pins on so the most important thing for them to try and learn is the nuances of the pin positions the ones they can attack the ones they can't the places they can and can't go because Augusta, because of the speed of the greens and the slope they encounter, you're out of position, you're dead. Mm. I thought it was so obvious What when I played. The golf course, where to go. We talk a lot about the experience. Yeah. Like I said, I did quite well my first year. But I, uh, I'm i sure there are many nuances that I didn't pick up in my... Are you saying it was too rounds. easy? It was too easy. <laughs> no, no, not too easy. But the experience <laughs> thing, I, I, th- I thought the course... It was it, there. It, it was there. It shows That's you roll a ball, it comes around. I thought it was quite, it, or maybe I just got it, you know, at yeah. my own level, you know, and I, I just thought. But that showed in your results as well, yeah, to be fair. I thought it was pretty obvious. Oh. I've got a counter there. Uh, please do. In his results, he goes 11th, 19th, 44th. So he's so worse. actually getting worse. <laughs> I mean, you're supposed to get better with the years going by, Augusta, because oh, no, you learn more about it. He's actually learning more about he it and getting beat, worse. No, no, really no, early. I'm saying that. Well, I think that proves my point. <laughs> oh, okay, right. Because yeah. it's obvious when you get there. But you know, okay. experience is obvious in the Okay, so you, got, you were thinking about it too much, are you saying? No, I just got by? worse as a golfer. Um, <laughs> it's got nothing to do with that. Um, That's a really I mean, interesting take on it, though. It I is. I know. I've never heard that before. So obvious. I've never heard Clearly, that before. you can't go left on one or a left hand pin. You're going to make. You can't go mm. long. It's 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 all just spelled out now. There's some absolute tiny nuances. Sure. That maybe you know you could have fed it round to twelve feet instead of eighteen feet or whatever you might. But basically, it's pretty clear and obvious to me where you do and don't go to most of the the, the pins. That's what it seemed to me. Okay. And I, I thought I knew it within two days. Uh, you know. So that. that he has, to be fair, and I'm not being flippant now, he's got an incredibly high golfing IQ. Not everyone would have his ability in terms of assessing situations and his experience at the time as well. So, um, you know, he's, he's very capable of doing that. But I think the majority of players say to me, wow, that is the most valuable four hours okay. of my life going around with Bernard Langer. And he's him telling me, right, this, that and the other. Even things like Phil Mickelson would, would say to a player, certain parts of your preparation, leave them as late on Wednesday as you can because you may go out there on Tuesday mm-hmm. and look at an area and say, oh, I could putt out of that swale. 
but actually by Wednesday they haven't cut it and you can't putt out of it. <laughs> or you couldn't putt out of the swell and Wednesday afternoon they cut it. So now you can putt out of it. Hey. And you haven't practiced it because you thought, well, I can't putt from that one, I'll have to chip. So they change things at the last minute. And, and again, the experience of the couples and the, and the Langers and, and Tiger and people, they understand it. Mickelson understands it. You know, it, It's no coincidence to me that, that Langer, Couples and Mickelson can compete at that golf course over the age of 50 where they can't compete at any other major. And it's the knowledge of the golf course that allows them to understand how to plot their way around and shoot a reasonable score. Mm. There's a reason no one's ever shot, well, sorry, no one's ever won shooting four rounds in the 60s. Cam Smith yeah. shot four rounds in the 60s and didn't win. Mm. But, you know, they, no one shoots four rounds in the 60s. And, and you'd think it would happen many times with the world's best players on display in a major championship. But that's how tricky it is. And that's how, if you get out of position, you're snookered. Mm. You going to say anything else, Howler, there? Was that it? I was going to say, oh, it's a long time ago now. If you four hours of Bernard Langer, just to clarify, that would be for nine holes. <laughs> it was only nine holes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you're not getting around. The practice rounds are slow because people are doing ch yeah, chips of and putts from all over the place. Of course. And there is a lot of that going on. Is there Langer... is a lot of course mapping going on. There's no doubt about that. Bernard yeah. playing this year? He's had to withdraw because of an injury. But I he, see, I And this was that. his swan song. He'd announced this oh. for his last Masters, but now he's announced he will play next year as his last oh, Masters. Really? <laughs> Already announced it. <laughs> Top 10 coming in next year, next year for Bernard. Um, on another note, David, how much of the food menu did you try at Augusta or have you tried? No, not a lot. I, there's some, I think there's a clam chowder that's fairly famous on the menu there. Okay. The but, the day. I remember that, but no, I, I don't remember too much about the no. food, got to be honest. Really? Yeah. Oh, it's a, what do you mean for the, for the, like, the, the pimento cheese sandwich? Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's a player. <laughs> different menu for I the still players. Th I still think you would have gone out and tried it though the peach ice cream sandwich I've heard yeah. is amazing I, I, from the people that I took there who were obviously yeah. in the galleries uh, thought the food was uh, it's famously cheap it is really um, still, still uh, the same prices and, yeah which is amazing and, and all very very nice um, yeah it's nice it's a nice experience as a as a spectator or a patron as they a patron, as yeah. they are known um, no doubt about that it's classy the way they do it and it's very well organised you tried in the food there that menu I've tried all of it, yeah. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I thought so. What's no, the best thing? The pimento cheese, yes. Is it really? Oh, it's lovely. Absolutely terrific. Oh, okay. yeah. You have to have it. It's iconic. You have to okay. try it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the whole thing is is beautifully well done, as everything at Augusta is in, in that sense. I mean, they, they look after the patrons extremely well. Um, you know, they don't allow so many people in that you can't get a view. Everyone's, you know, got the opportunity to see and yeah. and so forth. You put your chair down by the 18th green and it sits there all day waiting for you to come and sit on it, which yeah. is, you know, where That's would you nice. see that anywhere else in the world? That's like, so lovely, isn't like we, it? And we chatted earlier in the day about, you know, the things that um, Augusta do. And as a journalist, when you're there, there are certain restrictions they put on you that you think, oh, God, I can normally go and just do that and I'm not allowed to do it here. Um, but there you're not allowed to do it. But then you see things like, Nobody else inside the ropes other than the players and the caddies. Love that. Yeah. Just it's love clean. That. It's lovely. And the fact that they are, you know, they are allowing the, the, the patrons to enjoy the food and not have to think, well, that's a lot of money for a sandwich or a Coca-Cola or whatever it might be. So um, it, they do things beautifully, beautifully. Way well. more people on a practice day than a tournament day. Correct. Mm. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. right, isn't it? Yeah. And it's noticeable. Really, um, right. when you're when you're playing as well, yeah, yeah, it really is. And and what's also noticeable, my my friends did it as well. It's the it's the picking up of the grass, you know, just <laughs> eating a bit of grass or whatever, just touching the grown men, you know, just like, oh, putting it in their look, pocket. It's, all, it's, it's, the grass. it's just lovely. And actually, my coach made a, a point when um he was the, you know day one when we were back at the house after the first day, he said the atmosphere that first day would have would have been the Monday. He likened it to, you know, the first when you if you go to St. Paul's Cathedral or the Sistine Chapel or something, people just kind of in awe. Mm. And just the, the atmosphere is mm. a little bit strange because people, especially on the practice days, because, you know, it's regulars going a lot on the tournament days. Um, but, but you know, almost free access, you know, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, if you can get a ticket. And it's people very much, you know, respectfully Amazing. can't quite believe they're there. And it's really cool. Mm. Just finishing off the food point, I found out something couple of years ago and it was reiterated this week so it just reminded me do you realize the champion has to pay for the champion's yes, dinner i did so yes john, john ram went to augusta and said what's my budget for the champion's dinner and they said anything you like because you're paying for it yeah he went really and he said yeah you pay for the champion's dinner you're you're inviting these fellow champions to come and celebrate your victory last year and you will pay for whatever it is you provide yeah. but judging by your signing bonus uh it's a massive budget john <laughs> 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 I like John's menu a lot. It's obviously Spanish inspired, but a lot of the early dishes have potato in. So I like that he's trying to get all the pa 
past champions, just a little bit comatose, <laughs> a little bit and sleepy, then a heavy, yeah. cl- a heavy yeah. red wine as well. Very clever <laughs> from John. He won't be doing that. Uh, before we look at this year's runners and riders, I thought we'd look uh, look at our favourite masters moments from years gone by. I've asked Tim and uh, David beforehand what they would like to pick. David, you went with Sandy. We, it's a classic Sandy Lyle, isn't it? It is a classic Sandy Lyle. I mean, it's one heck of a shot, isn't it? And the reason this was, you know, one of the shots that inspired me to try and become a professional golfer. Is, it, right, is that right? Yeah, I was around my friend, uh, rest, God rest his soul, Toby Drayton's house, my best friend growing up, who sadly passed away at far too young an age, with his family, with other friends from Brew Manor Golf Club. We were watching this as excitable teenagers. And can you imagine? You know, we're watching, you know, a European, a Scot, a... Um, mm. coming up there with this putt to win and we were jumping for joy at this moment. It was the absolutely jig. brilliant. There it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, amazing. Uh, we would have been, well, next day would have been a school day, but Monday yeah. night would have been up the range. Completely and utterly inspired by that. There we go. And Larry Mize. And having got to know Sandy over the years. Yeah. Absolutely. A young Sandy gent. there as well. And Tim. You've gone for Jack. Of course, Jack. 1986, Jack Nicholas at the age Ooh. of 46, winning and becoming the oldest ever Masters champion. His sixth Masters. This is his second shot into 15, the par five. He said to his caddy, who's his son, Jackie, how far do you think a three will go? And Jackie said, well, 220, 250. No, he said, no, no, an eagle three. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's exactly what he made. He stuffed that one into 18 feet, hold the putt for yes. the three. Incredible. Came back in 30. Four behind with 10 holes to play. There's more to come here, Tim. Don't exactly. worry about that. Four behind with 10 yeah. holes to play. Greg Norman up there. Tiger Wood. Sorry, um, uh, Tom Kite up there. Severiano Ballesteros up there. That was such a good... That was uh, The shot there by Jack. And that set up a birdie too, which then proved to upset Seve to the degree that he hit it in the pond at 15, who was at the time his closest rival. This was the putt at 17. Who hasn't done that celebration? Oh, of yeah. Of course, as well. An incredibly difficult putt to read, but he and Jackie managed to unlock it. Yes, sir, was the commentator's yes, line as that yeah. went in. And it was just an incredible occasion to watch my hero. He'd been my hero my whole sort of life as a junior golfer growing up, wanting him desperately to, to go on and, and uh, win another Masters. And to do it at 46 was incredible. Go on, David. I was going to say so wonderfully old-fashioned so much of what mm. Jack did as well. I wanted the flaily swing, <laughs> um, you know, the big-headed the, the big headed putter. Just brilliant. Mm. Uh, amazing. Mm. And also... Uh, Stops the myth of faders can't win round Augusta as well. Which, well, exactly. Yeah. I mean, if you look at it, Jack Nicholas won six and he's a fader of the golf ball. Fred Couples has the record at the moment. Tiger maybe did this week, but has the record for the most consecutive cuts mm. along with Gary Player. He's a fader of the golf ball. And yet everyone says, oh, you've got to draw it, Augusta. You can't be competitive. Well, these are the two most successful players, arguably, in their own, in, you know, making most cuts and winning most Masters, and they're mm. both faders. Yeah. So it certainly can be done. There are holes that definitely suit a right to left flight, but you can certainly win the Masters without it. Mm, you mentioned Tiger there. Uh, I cannot let these Masters moments slip by without 2019 and Tiger. This, this for me is one of the most unbelievable moments in sport, let alone golf. 11 years from uh, his last major win, that was the 08 US Open. Uh, 43 years old, his fifth green jacket, the second oldest Masters winner ever. Uh, it, it just Tim, one of the great comebacks of sport. This was, I, everything, this gives me goosebumps watching this. Well, and look at the celebration. That's what it means to him because many, many people had written him off. And he said, no, no, I've got more in me. You just watch. And with all the surgery and all the injuries he'd gone through and the scandal in his private life and overcoming all of that and 11 years, as you say, after being a major mm. champion, there he is again putting on the green jacket. And again, further testament to, to one, how an incredible a golfer he was, but also understanding Augusta, understanding how to win there. So yes, he'd won the Tour Champs the year before. He was in decent form, but he went in there thinking he could do this because he loves Augusta. He, you know, I don't know how many top 10s, 14 top 10s, I think, something like that. Um, so... Incredible record there, loves the place, inspired by trying to get that green jacket. And boy, did he do it again in great style. It was incredible. I can remember watching all of that last round. Think, keep, 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 I kept thinking he can't do this. Yeah, we, I was down in Devon in a cottage and, and missed the start of it, listened on the radio. Okay. But we did, my kids were young then, uh, but sat with, with Emily, my wife, and we did actually watch it. Not often I'd sit and watch golf with, with my wife. Um, but that was, as you say, an incredible sporting moment. And it was um, it was. Thrilling, genius, isn't he? Yeah, you had what? You had one more, Tim. I forgot to. I've just just realised you also picked. You, we let Tim have two here, everyone. Ah, yeah. You picked Shota Matsuyama's caddy from twenty twenty one. 
Why did you like this moment so much? I think so many people did. Um, it was just that moment when Hideki had won the won the, the tournament, everyone celebrating around the green, and then suddenly his caddy Shota goes over to the pin, mm. stands by the pin, puts the pin back in the hole, faces down the 18th hole and just very solemnly bows. And afterwards, someone asked him why he'd done it, and he said, I just wanted to thank Augusta, thank mm. the golf course for allowing us to compete on it and show it the respect it deserves because it is in the most incredible venue in the world. And it, I think many people were touched by it. And every time I see it, it brings a lump to my throat. It's just so respectful, so classy. You know, you see people celebrate victories in lots of different ways, but what a classy thing to do. Just say, thank you so much for letting us do what we've just done. Yeah, I loved it. Loved it. It was a brilliant moment from three years ago. Uh, Matsuyama, he might come up in our picks later on. He is playing extremely well, the 2021 20, champ. Um, let's look at four players, though, who making the headlines um tim i'll come to you first scotty scheffler you have seen some great players throughout your time coaching and in your commentary role as well i know we, we've got a small sample size here of scotty but the golf he's playing at the moment is not even on this planet i think compared to a lot of other players where does he rank at the moment for you well clearly he's number one in the world right now and comfortably so yeah I would say, the way I would sum him up, he's one of the most complete players I've ever seen. And as you say, 32 years of working for Sky, 45 years of, of watching professional golf. He has every box ticked. So don't expect this guy to go away. This guy's mm -hmm. here to stay. I mean, OK, if the putter doesn't behave itself and we've seen there's a slight vulnerability maybe there, um, you know, he may not have the career that people are saying, well, could he be Tiger Woods, for goodness sake, because his ball striking is equal to that. But he has incredible consistency. And talking to his coach, Rick Smith, and, and asking him when he realized he had something special, he said, it's going to sound daft, but when he first came to me at seven or eight years of age, mm -hmm. he had an incredible ability to be repetitious. His golf swing was identical every single time. And that, re that reminded me of Monty. We're back to Monty. <laughs> Three times Mon now he's coming. Monty, not the most... Um, elegant golf swing in terms of technique it's not orthodox it's not correct but it was so repetitious he just did the same thing time after time after time scotty has that you then add to that the work ethic of vj singh because this guy works harder than just yeah, about yeah. anybody out there it's incredible he has a brilliant touch around the greens a temperament to die for you know he's just ticking every single box and it's of no surprise to me and i don't get many surprises to the people around him there was a reason that the Ryder cup team back in 20 20, was it, whatever, mm -hmm. wanted him on that team. They said, we need Scotty Scheffler mm -hmm. when he was a rookie because they'd seen, they'd seen what he had. And he is just a complete golfer with every box ticked. And I say, outside of injury and the putter cooling down significantly, he's going to be very hard to knock off world number one because he's just going to keep going. Mm -hmm. He's going to win three or four times a year, potentially for some time to come. Mm -hmm. He is the clear favourite this week. Howler, I noticed on Twitter X, Yesterday, you were watching on the range, and I saw you remark, you said you even loved the way he just grips the club every single time. Well, yeah, I, someone asked him at a tournament recently, what does he work on, you know, with his, with his coach? And he often, and he says, well, we work on the grip um, and alignment, you know, and I thought it was a bit of a, you know, naff answer. It was kind of like, I don't want to give anything away answer. But sure enough, really fascinating watching on the range yesterday. He is constantly chatting away to Ted Scott, his caddy, and, it, and he, he takes forever to put his left hand on the grip and he grips it and he does put time and effort into his grip on every shot when he's on the range. So, certainly what I saw last night, which is just a sign to me that he just keeps things so basic. You know, am I aiming straight? Because his, his swing basically doesn't break down. So as long as I keep doing aim straight, aim grip well, aim fire, ball goes in the right Easy direction. Game. Easy game. Um, and that's... That, that's that's wonderful. So, uh, I mean, listen, uh, it's great advice for any yeah. amateur. You, you've got an aim range. It always surprises me, winds me up when you see people trying to learn the game and the, the grips are all over the place. It's like it doesn't matter anymore because we see people with all sorts of grips doing well at golf. But let me tell you, it's a whole lot easier if you've got a good grip. <laughs> and there's no reason why you can't anyone can't put their hands on the grip just as well as Scotty Scheffler or Tiger Woods. He uses a moulded grip. He does. That every, was the point. Every yeah. single week he yes. has a moulded grip which literally guarantees your hands will go on in the same position. And he used that all through his career. It's amazing. And he keeps it every week. Yes. He puts his hands on. Does it feel correct? And if it feels weird, he knows his grip must be changing. But if it doesn't feel weird, yeah, it's exactly the same as it always is. It's perfect. I'll carry on. That, that was 
that was the quote that I heard. And I thought, oh, does he really? Yeah, no, he does. Yeah, there really. we go. He yeah. does. Uses a moldy Wonderful. grip. What a great example to everybody to say yes. if you want to start the game properly, get hold of one of those moldy grips. It just goes onto a regular club. Use an old club at home and put your hands on it every day. Waggle it around. Get some feel in your fingers for how a great grip feels. Then take it away and put it onto an ordinary golf club, and you've got the the perfect grip mm. to go and play the game with. Your only connection with the club head. Is your grip? Harrington so says that as well. If, exactly. if you've got says. control of the club head, you are a long way down to playing good golf. Exactly. We're a long way off talking about the Masters winning. <laughs> That's fine. This but is the best actually, bit of fucking. But isn't it strange that actually most you know, be, be, beginning the game? What, why not start with a moulded grip mm, with a, on yeah. a seven iron? Yeah. Obvious, isn't it? Mm. You said in the players' podcast when we were in here. You said you would love one player to dominate the game like Tiger did. Mm. Your wish might be coming true. Since the, I mean, he won the Arnold Palmer, then he won the players. Runner up at Houston, arguably could have won that. The way he's going, no one's close to him. No, they're not at the moment, and he's, you know, he's he's younger than Roy, than Roy by a good few years, isn't he? Um, so he's still his, you know, his um, his rise up the rankings is still relatively new, isn't it? You're talking about the two two Ryder Cups ago. He's only been in this position for a couple of years, really. Um, so he's got plenty more in the tank in terms of you know m momentum and. Um, He's just loving it, isn't he? And he could well stay up there for a good number of years, isn't he? He's so consistent. Mind you, the game's not that simple. And, no. and things go awry. A little injury, something happens. You know, Something will go awry at some point and Scotty Scheffler won't be quite as good as he is now. When will that time come? But for the time being, it looks like he's only likely to get better because his putting yeah. is improving rather than getting worse. Um, so, And I think it would be great for the game to have a dominant force. Um, he's a nice man. Um, he hasn't got the charisma of, of, of Tiger, but hey, who cares? If he's the best and the others are sh looking up, trying to take him down, I think that's quite a good thing for the game. Not bad. I've already got a green jacket. Go on, Tim. You're going to say one more thing there. Well, just that every time a player gets to world number one and starts to win two or three, four times a year, we go, oh, hang on, there's a dominant player. <laughs> it happened Jordan Spieth. Yeah. It happened Rory Mack. It happened John Rahm, it happened DJ when he got to world number one. So this is a conversation we have quite often, but I do genuinely feel this is different. I do genuinely feel this guy has so the I. consistency to potentially carry on for three, four, five years as world number one, unless they can up their games. If Rory gets back to Rory as we know Rory can be, then surely he's going to challenge Scotty Scheffler for world number one. But there's not many that can if he carries on anything like the pace he's on. Mm. Nice link, Tim, because Rory's next on my list. I mean... Still, I've done this before. You have done this before. Still looking for the Grand Slam. We know that, everyone. OK, let's put that to one side. Uh, we did hear news, Tim. He went to see Butch the other week. I think he said he's done it before. A good move? Is it ever a bad move to go and see Butch Harmon? <laughs> Apart from the fact he's a brilliant golf coach, he's a lovely individual, yeah. a great wine seller, I'm sure. He's yeah, probably got some, a great some wine of that. seller. But no, always a wonderful idea. I mean, he's worked with Michael Bannon since he was a, a small boy and they've done a fantastic job together over the years. But just occasionally, Rory wants a second pair of eyes to look at it. And someone with Butch's experience of working with multiple world number ones, major champions coming out of his ears all over the place, so much experience of fixing different issues with different players. And that's what Rory says he most enjoys about Butch, is that when he says, I'm trying to get a feel for this oh well when Tiger was trying to get that feel he did this when Greg was trying it he did that Freddie Couples felt this and he's got a library of stuff that he can draw on um, and essentially he came away saying that much of what Butch said was similar to what he and Michael were already working on it was just a slightly different way of saying it um, it appears to revolve mainly around his takeaway. His, his driving has been fantastic yeah. this year, it's probably as, well, as good as it's ever been. But his irons play has been really, really poor. I mean, I think he made 26 birdies at the players and almost as many bogeys and finished nowhere, which was incredible. Mm. So there were great iron shots in there, but there's some real scruffy ones as well. Low left with a wedge, you know, things you don't see Rory do. And they figured out that it was basically in his takeaway. They want to soften his right arm a little bit more so that when the shaft gets to parallel to the ground, they want it parallel to the target line or equal to his toe line. Because when Rory gets the club going outside too much or inside too much in the backswing, this time it was going inside and the right arm was getting behind him too much, then he has to manipulate. And okay. when he has to manipulate, too much hands through impact and all sorts of things can go wrong. But Butch said to him, look, if you can get the club neutrally away for the first three feet, all you've then got to do is turn to the top and hit it. And Rory started to do it last week, obviously, and finished third. Mm -hmm. His stats improved immeasurably yeah. from the weeks before. So it's it's definitely not something that he's absolutely locked on fixed, but it's a work in progress. But it showed incredible signs of improvement last week. And that means he can compete at Augusta, whereas the way he was swinging, he couldn't. 
there's a scary record of when people go to see Butch, they win very soon after seeing him. And it was only a few weeks ago where we went to see Butch. So uh, look out. Uh, Justin Ray, who is brilliant on Twitter, on X, everyone. Follow him if you don't. Statistician, worked for us at Sky uh, many a times. He said, Rory averaged 1.88 strokes gained approach per round uh, last week at TPC San Antonio, uh, Valero, Texas. By that metric, it's his best approach play week on the PJ Tour in nearly five years. Is that is that the thing you think for this week at Augusta? Is crucial for Rory approach play. I think he'll probably start driving it badly now. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna, it's gonna the game of golf. Remind him of ten. <laughs> um, uh, absolutely, I love everything about what Rory's build up is. He's been to see Butch. Perfect last week, third place. Yeah, you know. Lovely last round, stats looking better. Clearly, I'm sure something with his iron play must be feeling better. If he can match the two up, still drive it well and be better with his second shots, um, then yeah, he's going to be he's going to be chomping at the bit to get there this week. Coming in late, I believe, yeah, doing everything is. different, which makes That's perfect do sense. He knows the it? course now, um, and I don't think he's playing the par three tournament, is he? Which is which I think is good because it's. it's Kids all over the place, and uh, um, and it's carnage now, isn't it? Tony Finau doing his ankle. Yeah, yeah I don't need that. Steer clear of that. That's for the rookies that turn up, like <laughs> like me. Just get there, and um, he knows the course. Mm. Bring your game, play on Wednesday, go home, go out and try and win the Masters. Um, I think he's in good shape, and uh, you know he's got the scarring. You know yeah. that's he needs to bring his because he's, now he's got Scheffler to beat and and exactly, Ram and, yeah. and others. He needs to bring his A game. You know I felt Rory had many chances where he could have won Augusta with his B game. Uh, you know when he was at his best six seven eight years ago and he didn't manage his way round well enough. I used to find it very frustrating watching the, what appeared to be just silly mistakes. Um, I know the game's not that easy. We always talk about it, but missing long and left on ten because you're too aggressive. Stick in the middle of the green, putt from forty feet. You know you can't birdie them all. So they used to wind me up as a you know as a Rory fan and as a golf fan, um, but he's got to bring his A game now, and uh, and if he does, then he's still got a chance. And I think he's he's got enough in the tank mentally um, over the years, the uh, resilience he's built up um, to to get over that hurdle of what happened that first time he turned up and and had the chance to win um, with, the, with the horror story on ten. Um, he can get over that. It's one tee shot, isn't it? You get past that. Mm. That's where it happened. You know, Spieth's nightmare happened on 12, so he's got to get past that. Um, and I think he's in the best shape for a while coming into a Masters um, to, to, to prove to be a good week, hopefully. But it, one more thing. Also. It's just mental, isn't it? It's it. The, the yeah. issue with Augusta is a mental issue, and I completely understand it. I remember interviewing Phil Mickelson once and asking him, Okay, you're another guy like Jordan Smith and, and uh, Jordan Spieth and, and Rory McIlroy who's got the opportunity to complete the Grand Slam. And Phil has won three of the majors and finished second at the US mm. Open six times. <laughs> so he's the nearest person to completing the Grand Slam other than the five guys who've done it. And I asked Phil, how much of a difference would it make to the way you feel about your career if you were to complete the Grand Slam? And he said, totally different. Totally different. Mm. Because now I am part of a, me- a, a six-member mm. club who have done the ultimate, won all four majors. Every time Rory McIlroy turns up at the Masters, he's got that weight. He's the only European to win three different majors. So no European's ever had the chance to win the Grand Slam. Every year he turns up, he's got that opportunity. And I'm afraid to say, and understandably so, he gets in his own way. He wants it too badly. He tries too hard. And as Butch Harmon said to him, apparently, Christ, you're Rory McIlroy. You're one of the best players in the world. You've won 20 times since you last won a major and all of them big championships against these yeah. guys. Just go be Rory. Mm, yeah. Just go and be Rory. Mm. So it's a mental hurdle for Rory. And, and hence you see the poor starts. He hasn't got off to a great start. No. Five years since he was in the top 30, I think, in the, after the first round. And no one wins from there. Exactly. They, they, no one ever does. The no. leaders tend to get out fast and stay up there. So he needs a better start and somehow, and I say, I'm not suggesting for a minute, it's easy just to go out there and say, right, forget it's to complete the Grand Slam, just play. It's incredibly difficult, hence only five people have ever done it. But it's a mental hurdle rather than a physical one. Yeah, but is it any, I don't know, only Phil and Roy would, would, could tell you, but is it any harder than going ahead and winning your first major, which is the giant hurdle for most people. You know, just wanted to be a major champion. You, one's not one's enough. You get one, you want more. But for most people, you know, as a kid growing up, to be a major champion, if you're on tour, you want to be a major champion. That hurdle's huge. Mm. Well, very often, three or four people get across that line each each mm-hmm. year. So I'm not sure it's any... 
well, you'd have to ask him, is that hurdle bigger than winning your first major? I, I, I don't know. What When he was winning his first major, he was winning by six, he just out-golfed everybody. Yeah. It didn't matter how nervous he was over the last three hours. He was five, six in front. Don't think that can happen this week because some of the people that he's up against, Sheffield being one, are, are too good to go and surge away and win by five or six. But yeah, he needs a different mental plan is what you're saying, isn't it? Because he's got to get off to a better start. Um, and I just like the way he's doing. He's going about it differently. Uh, if he can have a different mentality when he gets on that first tee with Harry, you know, his, his sidekick, yeah. they've got to think differently, haven't they, from the word go, and only they can tell you what that plan is. But they need to be thinking about doing it, thinking differently from the go. One incredible stat, sorry, from Justin Ray again. He goes, everyone eats on the par fives at Augusta, but it's a truly staggering disparity for Rory. In his career... He's 94 under on the par fives at the Masters. He's 67 over on par threes and par fours. That's, that is unbelievable. Well, again, Haller alluded to it earlier on. I think that's potentially historically, and maybe not so much in recent years, but historically down to him being too aggressive on the par threes and par fours. Par fives, okay. he's going to hit in two. He's going to be around the green. Right. He's going to make birdies. But those he's chased pins, arguably, in the past that maybe he shouldn't have done. And he's, he, he admits to being an incredibly aggressive golfer who finds it difficult to play conservatively. So I think some of that stat comes down to the fact he's attacked pins that he shouldn't have done, got out of position, couldn't make par, suddenly a bogey's on the card. Yeah. You need it. Bernard Langer would have, you know, a plan. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, that's just that's the plan. Hardest thing in the world to stick to a plan, and they're the most powerful things in the world. I am not going at that back right pin mm -hmm. on ten. Uh, and then Harry needs to step in. No, you said we weren't doing that. So it's middle of the green. Yeah, mm. but it's just when you get the yeah, but I can, I, I, mm. I've got that shot. Well, the plan isn't. And if, once you've got the plan, going against it is very difficult to do because you've got it almost written down, haven't you? Mm -hmm. We're playing to the middle of the green on 10. And then when you start talking about being more aggressive, well, there's a warning sign, isn't there? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I probably need... Uh, whether, maybe he's done that over the years anyway. Maybe, maybe he just pull-ups it on 10 occasionally <laughs> and, and it looks like it's a mental error or a course management strategy. Yeah. Never quite know. He'll know, though. And if he's really honest with himself, he'll know where he keeps making mistakes. Augusta's difficult. The par fives are easy for him. He hits it 330 mm -hmm. yards pretty straight. Um, the rest of the golf course is pretty darn challenging. <laughs> yeah. um, and, if you, and if you miss the fairways, which they all do, you know, on 40% of the occasions, um, even that's the world's best drivers, then it gets very difficult indeed to get it on the greens. And when you miss the green, it's hard to get up and down. So, um, yeah, let's hope he's got a, a different plan in place and uh, he can excite us this week. Mm. I'm going to move on. To the defending champ. Only three players have gone back to back. Jack, Sir Nick, Tiger. Uh, John Rahm looking for to be the fourth of those. Uh, he was the fourth Spanish winner last year on what would have been Seve's 66th birthday. And incredibly, well not incredibly because it's Masters week, today we're recording would have been Seve's 67th birthday as well. I did check before we came in. Uh, but John, he was fourth last week, lived Miami. How do you think he's get on, going to get on defending his title? Obviously, not had the reps that other players have had, playing three rounds, shotgun start, things like that. Do you think that matters to John Rahm at all? I think it does in the form he's in, because I've, I've watched a bit of Liv, and I've seen the way he's playing, and he's contending every tournament that he plays, and okay. people say, well, he should be winning. He's a third-ranked player in the world, and you know these fields aren't as strong as the PGA Tour. But there are 20 or 25 really top-class players playing there now and playing some good golf. Um, and he hasn't yet won, but he's contended every single one that he's played. But he's just hitting the odd destructive shot. I watched uh, on, on Sunday and, you know, he hit a medium iron into the middle of a lake, which you just wouldn't see him do. And and the day before, he pulled Drew a, a, a medium iron into the trees and missed the green by 30 yards. And he's just not John Rahm like at all. Having said that, he's hitting a lot of quality shots as well. And he's contending in these fields, which are, you know, noteworthy fields. Um, so his game's not in the best place. Last time when he won the Masters, he came in with three wins already yeah. in that calendar year. So he went in there having had incredible form and incredible confidence. He hasn't got that form. He hasn't got that confidence. How big a factor the 54-hole shotgun start thing is, who knows? I mean, last year, people were sort of saying, well, these live boys, they don't yeah. play proper golf. They're not <laughs> going to have any, any chance of doing well at Augusta. And they finished three of them in the Phil top five. Phil nearly wins. Yeah, Phil nearly <laughs> wins. Kepka nearly led into the final yeah. round and, and top five. And, and Patrick Reed top five. So any question mark that these guys aren't competitive, I think, went away straight away there. And then Brooks going on to win the next major. I think Bryson and, and Cam Smith finished top five in a couple of majors as well. So they're competitive, there's no doubt about that. John Rahm himself isn't at the peak of his powers right now. And unless he can find it, he's going to struggle to, mm. to defend that title, which, as we know, is one of the most difficult to defend. Do you think the 
the live the other tours thing is going to be a bit less this year do you think do you think everyone's just accepted it now and it's just everyone just wants to see good golf at augusta yeah possibly i think the enormity of the decision that john made um still will come with him this is the first major since he made the mm. decision, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that comes with him, you know, almost like a, a, a little bit of a, a shadow. Um, well, maybe not a shadow. It could it could be an inspiration to him. I want to, if he comes with that that live mindset, I want to prove the rest that this was a good decision to make so different. Maybe it could give him a maybe it could give him a boost. Um, but you said he's not absolutely in top form. I don't think the amount of golf they're playing necessarily makes any difference to them yeah. I mean they played last week three rounds it's probably ideal isn't it three rounds Lovely. It's four it's not four it's not quite as much um, ideal still competitive and, and he was you know not far off the lead was he um, so he's obviously playing reasonably well um, I just yeah I feel like unlikely he de- we know it's unlikely he defends um, and having switched sides it makes it a slightly bit more unlikely that he goes on to win the next major, which happens to be this one, since he made that decision. So don't see him defending. Okay. Um, there we go. Don't see him defending. There we go. But that's an early, uh, early uh, thing for Howler there. I haven't but... watched him at a shot in eight months in fairness. <laughs> but, but don't. He's see got him. no chance. <laughs> but don't see him defending. Uh, okay, not defending. Oh, we should mention Tiger. Uh, hasn't missed, missed a cut, as you said, since 96. I didn't realise that stat until earlier this week. Uh, he's been out there early. I think he was there Sunday. Mm-hmm. Maybe he was there before. I don't know. What are you expecting of Tiger this week? We've hardly, to be at Ram, we've hardly seen. I think nothing of Tiger. We really haven't. I mean, obviously, just the one start of Genesis this year and, and withdrew um, through having flu, not injury. I think we all expected to see him either at the Arnold Palmer Invitation or at the players in order to get some competitive reps under the table before he turns up at Augusta, and he didn't. And if it was flu, which it was, it looked like he had flu, to be honest, he looked like he was really struggling. You have to wonder whether physically he just wasn't able to get uh, in a state where he could play Arnold Palmer or players. So he's now coming to Augusta, and and we just don't know how he's playing. Nota Begay, who's a very close friend of his, put out the other day that he has almost no mobility in the injured ankle, the one that was very nearly amputated after the car crash. He said he's zero mobility in that ankle. He's now having lower back issues because of the way he's walking and having to compensate for the ankle. And he said he also doesn't know if he can walk 72 holes. And as we know, Augusta is taxing physically because it is as silly as Howler talked about earlier on. The lies are all slopey. They're all challenging in that respect. So it's a tough course physically for your feet and your, for your legs. Um, so what to expect from Tiger is is really who knows. I mean, he hasn't made a, a top 10, I think, on the on a, on a the PGA Tour for four years. Wow. So is he likely to turn up and win at Augusta? No. But if he's going to do it anywhere, it <laughs> would be here. And, and I watched him win the US Open in 2008 with a broken leg. And that leg was broken, ladies and gentlemen, because yeah, I went was... and walked some holes with him and heard the grinding noises of the oh. bones on each other. It was horrific. <laughs> Mm, so I'm never going to say never with Tiger Woods, ever, because mm. the man is, is in, in, capable of things that other humans are not. But this is the biggest mountain he's ever had to climb. And I think if he made the cut, that would be a terrific achievement. If he went on to contend, then amazing. But on this golf course, with the knowledge we've talked about and his craft around this particular place, if he's going to do it anywhere, this would be the place. But can he get through it physically? Can he walk four rounds? They're saying they don't even know if he can walk four rounds. Yeah, with the hills there as well, it's... Uh... Going to be interesting with Tiger. I just want to get a couple of uh, viewers' questions in for both of you as well. MB Rabs has asked, can a player who has Augusta scar tissue win? Uh, can Spieth get past the 12th on Sunday, for instance? Yes. Yeah, they, they, they can. I mean, it makes it all the more difficult. But let's face facts. For Spieth, he gets there again. It's just a 9 iron. <laughs> over the middle of the bunker yeah. ultimately it's just an or whatever it be it's a nine line over the bunker you come up slightly short you go in the bunker um so yeah they have rory has the t-shirt on 10 uh, you know and, and the grand slam you know um uh so yeah people have done it before um i, I mean I'm not the greatest golf historian but mm. listen everyone who's won augusta will have had some scar tissue yeah from a previous chance, yeah, unless you're Fuzzy Zeller, who won, you know, as a debutant. So, um, you know, it took Phil years to get over the line. He had many chances, didn't make it. He had to get over mm. his scar tissue. It might have been an innocuous one. He might have just, you know, hit a bad shot into 17 one year that we didn't really count. It wasn't as painful as the, as the Rory or Spieth situation. So, yeah, absolutely. These guys are the best players in the world. They're the great, they're great thinkers. 
um, as well. And everyone carries a bit of scar tissue with them. Um, and uh, on any given week, any pro that wins, you know, on any tour in the world, they're getting over something that's gone wrong before. They get over that hurdle. They just think differently in that very moment. And um, it, it could just be that, that, that Rory or Spieth have that shot 10th and 12th for them. Hit a good one. Didn't have to be that good, does it? Find the green. Bit of a yank with an iron iron. Two putt. And, you, and he's off then. Mm. So, so yes. Because he's our last uh, player on their Masters debut to win. Usyk Berner says, Is it too early to consider Ludwig Oberg a major contender? He's ninth favourite according to some of the odds this week. It's certainly not too early to consider him a contender because he is exceptional and mm. will go on, in my opinion, to win majors and to challenge for world number one positions, etc. because he is literally a wonderful, wonderful golfer who is still learning his craft. Now, having said that, uh, Augusta, other than Mr. Howell, who said he found it relatively straightforward, course <laughs> management-wise, most rookies find it very difficult because they will make the odd tactical mistake and think, oh, I shouldn't have gone at that pin or I, I, I didn't realise if I hit it there, it's unputtable from that position to get to that pin, whatever. So it's a big challenge at Augusta because of the nuance of the golf course and how you just cannot afford to, to miss in the wrong places and hit certain shots in the wrong places. And and players will, you know, Scotty Scheffler said to me a while ago that when he's playing, say, to a, a pin that is incredibly difficult, tucked away on the left-hand side of a green, he will play the shot that gives him the biggest margin for error. So he'll play 25 re feet right of the pin with a draw. If it draws as much as he's expecting, he'll finish just right of the pin because he was playing for a margin for error. If it draws a bit more, he's by the pin, looks clever. <laughs> if it doesn't draw at all, he's in the middle of the green. If he pushes it, he's missed the green right, loads of green to work with. And to miss the green left in the one place you don't want to go, he'd have to hook it. And he trusts himself to hit that that's the only one of five potential outcomes that does him a damage. So if you've got that mentality and you go around and you understand every pin that you can't miss and where you can't miss it, then you can do it. And he's a very bright guy and he's learnt golf courses very quickly, Oberg. So it's possible. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if he contended. I'd be surprised if he won. OK. Uh, any British interest before we come on to your picks at all? That you're that like, I would say Shane Lowry is playing some tremendous golf at the moment. Yeah, Shane um, has been he's been there or thereabouts a few times, you know, in the last few months, hasn't he? Good record um, at Augusta as well. Yeah, he's got... I mean, he's a great shape of the golf yeah. ball, Shane. Short game. Um, you, you're right, good chipper, chips with the lob wedge all the time, um, generally speaking, uh, which actually most chip shots are, are played with loft around Augusta. Into the grain, the chipping's difficult. So you want to be, you know, very competent around there. I could see, see Shane having a, yeah. a a good week. Do I see him winning the Masters this year? Um, no, I, 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 okay. don't see, I don't see that. Uh, Fleetwood, I don't, he hasn't got a great record at Augusta, has he? No. Um, which is kind of strange. Really strange. Could see him doing a little better than before. So I, I'd look for Tommy to, to do better. Than, than normal. Okay. Um, I think he's going to struggle to to win. I would love to see Tommy would look good. Oh, in the jacket, wouldn't he? Wouldn't it? He would look wouldn't really he? good in the jacket. Smart. As would Shane, of course. Of course don't he get me wrong. Irish green. Um, so yeah, I'd look for them to to play well. Um, listen, if you it's 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 an obvious golf course. In my mind, I see it different. To, you've got to hit it. You've got to hit the ball well, tee to green. You've got to do everything well. So players that are coming in with nice form. Um, when you look at it, if you piece the holes together. Um, one by one, you think, yeah, I can get around there in a couple under, you know, and, and that's all, often it's for, it's for them, isn't it? Um, of course, <laughs> it's more difficult than that, isn't it? Of course it's more difficult than that, but uh, see no reason whatsoever why Shane Lowry and, and yeah. Tommy Fleetwood couldn't go ahead and have a, have a great week. Okay, let's have a couple of picks from all of us. Can I, can I first, should we first just say, uh, how do you bet against Scotty Shuffler at the moment? I'm I'm going to, but I'm just putting a big Taylor Gooch asterisk and saying, I think he's damn hard to beat this week. Yes, although the Players' Championship, we were having exactly that conversation. We, Nick and I did a sort of preview okay. piece and we talked about, you know, everyone was saying, well, this is Scottish Chef is going to win this. And Nick sort of turned to me and said, it isn't that easy, is it? But no. Of course it's not that easy. It's an incredibly difficult golf course. It suits every style of player. Anyone can win here. We've seen that down the years. You know, blah, 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 blah. Giving all the reasons why Scotty, you know, isn't a guaranteed win. Then he goes and wins it with an injured neck. You know, it couldn't, it couldn't <laughs> yeah. swing the golf club properly for two days and yeah. still won it. So he is locked on as the favourite. He will be extremely hard to beat if he continues to play anything like he, he has been. His putting is going to be tested to the nth degree. We've talked sure. about the difficulty of the greens. That has proved to be a bit of a nemesis. If he 
putts as well as he has in the last two or three tournaments, he definitely will contend and potentially win. If he goes back to the odd miss one on those greens and his confidence goes, you might see him okay. not challenge as, as strongly as, as ever. But, yeah, it's impossible. If you if you said to me, put your house on a player, it would yeah. have to be Scotty Scheffler. There's no argument. Yeah, don't argue. Who's your first pick, though? Shane Larry. Oh, I didn't know. I don't know these both picks, by the way, everyone. Okay, yeah. how come Shane? I just think uh, third at the Arnold Palmer Invitational yeah. went well again at the players. I chatted to him at the players, interviewed him a couple of times at the Skycart, and I don't think I've ever seen him feeling as confident about right. his game as he currently is. Right. He's a major champion. He's won the Open. We know he's he's got the ability to to do that and get over the line in in the ultimate pressure, which is a major. Um, I think you know his short game is is a big plus for him. Again, the putter is the only question mark. Shane has times when he puts very well and times when he's pretty ordinary. He can't afford an ordinary week. But if Shane puts well, I would expect him to be right there. The only thing I suppose gets in my head a little bit is in that he knows he's almost in the form of his life. Can he contain the excitement? Okay. And he's looking forward to it. This is my chance to win Augusta. Can he hold that back and just go play golf and allow what's been coming out for the last few weeks to continue to come out? If he can, I think Shane Lowry's a real threat. I don't think he's had a, out, he's been outside the top 25 or something like that, Augusta. He's got a great the record. Last, the, no, he had a relatively poor record early on. Okay, and right. the last three, he's finished last in the top three. 25. Right. So he's he's discovered the formula. He's learnt, maybe, some of the nuances. Mm. Um, and, and the last three, I think, yeah, top 25 finishes, I think, third couple of years back okay. so he's proved he can be right there in the thick of it and the form he's in I would expect him to go well again I'm not going to pick favourites I always try and pick somebody Lovely. a little bit further down so Shane would be my pick the other thing with the UK thing there's only five or six if Willett gets to play I was thinking about this when I asked the question there's actually five or six UK players in the field and two years ago there was 15 Wow. So, you know, we've lost, obviously, some yeah. players to live who are now got, not getting the world ranking points to get in. The Westwoods, the Polters, yeah. and, and people have obviously got to that age where maybe they wouldn't have got in anyway. But, yeah, we're down to just six UK golfers if Danny mm. Willett's fit to play, and only five if he isn't. So, Ro Rosie, what a shame. and then who are the other two? I'm trying to think who the other two are. Uh, Hatton. Hatton. Hatton, yeah. Fitzpatrick. And Fitzpatrick, Fitzpatrick that's yeah. it. So, wow. uh, Willett, if he's fit, and it's yeah, okay. arguable whether he will, but he's got a shoulder problem, um, he would make the sixth. But, yeah, we used to have 15 in there and think, yeah, this nice. gives us a really good chance, one in six chance kind of thing. Now we're down to just five or six players, so wow. sad. Okay, who's your first pick for this week? Rory. <laughs> oh, don't do this to us. How can I left? do that? Of course you can. Can I go there? You go for the dream. Yeah, as if he just, if he just turns up and nips it nips around for nine or eighteen on yeah. Wednesday. Um, I just like that final round last week, third place. See, I could just see it, couldn't you, Butch? I know. I, I Butch. Yeah. Butch, another another win. Yeah, the golden touch. You could you could you could see that. Just just saying the one thing. Um, I think we're always excited about his golf again. You know, having that performance last week might just be lovely timing. Might just be lovely timing. And um, well, Sergio played well last week. He lost in the playoff. Mm -hmm. did. Um, True. Uh, he can get around Augusta. We know that. You know, he's won the thing. Um, so, uh, and he's playing nice golf this year, uh, Sergio. Uh, I think he's, has he lost in two playoffs. I think he has lost, lost in two three altogether. Yeah, he's has he? wow. in the playoffs and lost yeah, yeah. them all. But... As long as he doesn't end up in a playoff. In a playoff. Yeah. <laughs> Although he's got a good record um, in a playoff there. Uh, yeah, awesome. and it might be just that, you know, um, you know he's. A year on, or two years in now, isn't it, to live for Sergio? Mm. He's took the flak to early doors. Probably just a little bit more at peace with where he's at in in, in the world and the grand scheme of things. Um, and uh, he might just come in and relax a little bit more. Obviously playing well because yeah. Doral is a very, very tough golf course. Very tough. As is Augusta. So uh, why not Sergio for a good week? Okay, uh, I'm going against all the history, all the recent history. Uh, we've already mentioned him. I picked Ludwig Oberg for this in December before he won the RSM. I'd seen him in Switzerland and I'd, I'd seen it and his driving is some of the most impressive driving, long and accurate. He'll never miss the middle of the fairway. His approach play, I'd argue, has got better. He just needs the putting is that he knows the putting is his weakness out of his game. He needs a relatively hot putter. I think he's up there. I really think he's got a great, great chance. I, I, he's just got the game. He's got the game. Well, he's a great. Master. I mean, statistically, I was looking at the last time I, I was yeah. in. His iron play is actually his strength. It I is. Mean, he is. He is a great driver of the golf. Yeah. But there's many that drive it well, and then it's sort of you know this tiny you know point ones and point twos. And he is a great driver of the golf yeah. ball, by the way, of course. Um, but his iron play is spectacular statistically, and it is a second shot. If you give a given that they all drive how they normally do, it's a second shot and around the green golf course. He's got the second shots. Is he an, an exceptional putter uh, and chipper? 
Um, maybe not the strength is in a second, but he could beat the course of death with his with his with his, team, with his approach play. He'll eat the par fives um, up. As so well. yeah, I, I like I like that. Can yeah. I change? <laughs> <laughs> I picked. You can t- me and Henny had major picks, and I picked him early on this year, and, and nothing swayed me so far this year. So I'm sticking with that. Comes at about the right time in his career as well, doesn't it? First major, you know. What I mean, it, it, it could do. He's, he's such a fast rise. Major championships going to come, aren't they? I was just trying to think, thinking statistics and talking about. Oberg and, and also um, Wyndham Clark. Yeah. Two guys in the top 10 of the world who've never played the Masters. It's extraordinary. <laughs> it's amazing. It can't happen very often that you go to the Masters as a top 10 player in the world for the first time. So, interesting to see how Clark does as um, well. Wyndham, he's yeah, another guy that Wyndham's has been in player. brilliant form. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's a fantastic player. He could player. do it. He's a so, fantastic player, Wyndham Clark. Second pick, Tim. Uh, Hideki. Oh, okay. I'm glad someone's picked him. Yeah, Hideki. Yeah. Uh, for the reason that he's won there before. Uh, he's won Genesis this year, which is a really tough track and, and needs your long game mm. to be in terrific shape. Um, I think he went on to finish 12th at the Arnold Palmer and 6th at the Players. So the last three or four starts, he's right there every time. Oh, well, so. last week, I think, as well. Yeah. So cool. he's he's right there. His form is, is terrific. Um, he's number one in strokes gained around the greens this is year. Mm. Is he really? So you go to Augusta with your long game in great shape, which is evidenced by the stats and also these performances we've talked about, and then you're number one around the greens. <laughs> Again, the putter is the question mark. The putter, yeah. it needs to be warm at least. Um, but if, if the putter's warm, Hideki's going to be there on Sunday afternoon, I think. Already a green jacket in the closet for Hideki as well. So knows the place. Hey, apart from Sergio, any other any other players that you wanted to pick for this week? I think I went with Rory and Sergio. Rory right? and Sergio, I don't think yeah. I've got a third. You've got a third. Okay, no, good. No, be one of those two, as I said. So Yeah, yeah sure. Um, but just looking forward to it. Mm, right. Yeah, I think Fleetwood and Fitzpatrick need careful attention. I think, yeah. Again, Fleetwood's looked very, very good times this year. He won his first start of the year in Dubai, and and Fitz is coming into form. So those two guys would be on my radar as well. You've gone for a live player. My second pick's a live player. Whacking Neiman is possibly one of the best golfers on the planet. Outside of Scheffler, I think he's one of the best golfers on the planet. Two wins and a fifth. Uh, two wins on live. Top fives in Oman, Dubai, and Hong Kong. One Aussie Open. He was the fifth the week before that. And you look at his record at Augusta, he's improved every time. He's the opposite to Howler. He's improved every single time he's played Augusta. He's got the game. His, his iron play is just world class. And he's genuinely got a great chance, Neiman. Yeah, I, I agree really with think... you. Coming in, I was thinking about, you know, which which of the live players yeah. were fancy. And he was the one just Sergio's performance last week, you know, caught my attention, I guess. But Wacken, amazing um, tour around the world in yeah. the last year to, 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 to make his way into these majors still. Fair play to him. He's done what's needed to be done to make sure he's in these majors. And he is, as you say, one of the world's best players at the moment, no doubt. Last six months, he is right up there. Yeah, um, yeah very impressive. Um, but uh, he's not going to get past Rory or Sergio. <laughs> There we are. There we are. We heard it here first. I know. Guarantee none of those are going to win, everybody. Um, I think that about wraps things up. Nothing else really to talk about. Um, enjoy Masters Week. It's one, it is one of the great weeks. This is an open week. I know maybe open week is maybe your favourite, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, open before, would yeah. always be my favourite. This, this is a Because, class. as we talked earlier on, there's not been a major for nine months. We're all so eagerly anticipating this. And because it's played on the same golf course and we're all so familiar mm. with it and we know where they're going to put those pins, there's a really something very special about Augusta and the Masters and we just cannot wait for it to start. Yeah. How long is see you at Masters breakfast this week? On the Look, weekend anyway. Looking forward to it. Should be good. Yeah. Yeah. Bright and early. I'll have a coffee. One sugar, please. Thank you very much. I shall get that ready for you. (laughs) Okay. Thanks, you too. Uh, Thanks very much for watching and listening, everybody. Enjoy Masters Week. It's going to be a cracker.